This is Photographing the West Podcast, the podcast for people who love to explore the western highways and byways while photographing the landscape and wildlife. And now here's your host, Kirby Flanagan. Hello, and welcome to episode number 64 of the Photographing the West Podcast. Twice a month, we bring you interesting interviews with people doing interesting things. Each episode is brought to you by Photo Tees, wearable art for people who love nature and wildlife. Today I have with me Kevin Dooley, wildlife photographer, famous for his African wildlife photos. Welcome to Photographing the West, Kevin. Well, thank you, Cher. It's an absolute honor to be here. I have, uh, I've seen your photography, I've listened to your podcast, and I highly admire you. You're an excellent, excellent person. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. So, Kevin, tell everyone about yourself and your photography. Well, I was born in, uh, in New York and swiftly moved to New Mexico. And uh, my mother was married to a professional photographer. It was actually my stepfather. My real father was a dog trainer and a horse trainer. And my stepfather got me into photography when I was, oh, probably 13, 14 years old. He gave me my first camera, and it was, uh, it was, it was go, go, go from that point on. He taught me everything about darkroom work, and he actually had a studio, which I worked in all through high school. And after a short, uh, you know, enlistment in the Navy, so it wasn't too short, but I was a three-year enlistment, and. After that, I opened up my studio. It was when I was 21. And that's a portrait and wedding studio, which I've had now for a good 37 years. We still photograph a lot of weddings and do a lot of seniors and things of that nature. However, for the last 16 years, I have also been an avid wildlife photographer and also have a safari business as well as a photography workshop and training type of business that I do in addition to the studio. Wow. <laughs> You're a busy guy. Yeah. Actually I, I do stay pretty busy, but you know, if when I have that camera, I'm I'm happy. So Yeah. There you go. So you're probably best known for your African safaris, I think, in, in general. How did these get started? Well, my wife is from South Africa, and I actually met her online. It's one of those famous online stories, you know, and she was my tutor. I was trying to learn how to speak the language of Afrikaans, which is a prominent language throughout South Africa, uh, filtering a little bit over into Botswana and Zambia and those areas that sort of surround South Africa. And she was my tutor. And... Um, you know, she's such a phenomenal person. And and I just, it was like every time I started to learn Afrikaans from her, I just couldn't stop thinking, wow, I really like this gal. And so on my next trip to Africa, we met up and, well, to make a long story short, you know, we've been married now for 14 years. Wow, that's quite a story. So you have some uh, wonderful African wildlife portraits, especially of elephants, uh, how do you manage to get so close safely and get those uh, wonderful portraits? You know, there's a lot of uh, a lot of different techniques that we use for those images, and I'm actually a certified wildlife guide in Africa, and and that's a it's a very extensive certification, and part of that certification is learning animal behavior and and basically how to read an animal and how to know when you can and can't get close and things like that. Now, you know, we don't ever want to do anything that is unsafe to either the animal or ourself. So we use a lot of telephoto lenses, of course. But on the other hand, there are some safari locations we go to where we have dugouts or sort of, you know, photography pits, for lack of a better word, maybe a photo hide where we can actually go in there and we can sit mere two to three feet away from a water hole. And when the wind is right and we're quiet and we have the right frame of mind, you know, I'm a firm believer that wildlife can actually pick up on what you're thinking. Maybe not, you know, in a real uh, extensive way, but certainly fear 
or aggression or non-fear and non-aggression. And I think they pick that up in you. And, you know, if you have the right sort of frame of mind, the right feelings towards the animals and you're in the right place, you can actually get fairly close to these animals without putting yourself or the animals in any sort of danger. Well, that's a uh, different approach from a lot of the commercials safaris that you read about. Uh, how, how did you get started doing that? Well, I've always been a lover of animals. And, you know, when I was younger, my stepfather, in addition to photography, we spent a lot of time in the mountains. We slept on a lot of, in a lot of tents on a lot of hard grounds and sat around a lot of campfires. And he taught me some of the most amazing philosophies and, and relationships between humans and animals. And so as I progressed, I, I started reading a lot of books about explorers in Africa and watching movies about that, as well as, you know, people that were exploring India and other places that were certainly very, very exotic to me personally. Um, I just, I ha that was the place I knew I wanted to be. You know, I, I had such a happiness in my heart. I felt such amazing things. I would become immersed in those stories. I would become those characters. And so, I just knew I wanted to spend my life doing that. And I've done everything I possibly can to fulfill that that dream of mine. And that's where I am today, out there doing that, um, living my dream, so to speak, but living it in a very humble and a very respectful way. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So African megafauna has been extensively photographed to say the least, uh, your photos are fresh and unique. How do you manage that? Um, that's a hard question. Um, you know, my photography is me, I guess. It's it's the way I see things. It's the way I imagine it. Or sh I don't even know if imagine it is the right word, although I do spend many nights having visions of my images, you know, dreaming about them and creating them before I actually ever take them. I, I guess I try to relate to the animals in a different way. I try to I try to photograph the animals looking for almost human expressions. And I know that's strange because obviously the animals may not think the same way humans do, but the only expressions, of course, that I'm familiar with are human expressions. And so when I'm photographing these animals, I'm actually looking for that element of that connection, that place where the viewer can actually look at that photograph and connect to it, can feel something from it. And that's what I go for in my images. That's the most important thing to me. And I hope that's a good answer. It's, it's sort of the best answer I have. Yeah, I think it is. I certainly get that feeling when I look at your images, particularly uh, some of those close-ups of, uh, of uh, elephants and uh, uh, there definitely is a connection, I think, uh, however you achieve that. Well, thank you. So how do you pick your safari locations in Africa? That's a very, very good question. Um, you know, obviously, I'm a photographer, and the safaris that we do are primarily safari-oriented, or I mean, photog photographically oriented. And so... I try to stay away from the places that are overused, overcrowded, because we find that, you know, if you pull up on an animal, if you're in a safari vehicle and you pull up on an animal and you're disturbing that animal from his natural habitat, you know, no matter how many vehicles that animal has seen, he's, he's going to hear the noise, he's going to see you, he's going to feel the dust in the air, he's going to feel the, the conversation going on. And so the more people that are around a sighting, the more interruption there is in that animal's life, the less likely you're going to be able to create an image that is actually a real interpretation of that emotion that I was just describing to you a few minutes ago. So we're always looking for places where, number one, it's not crowded. Number two, we can go off road as long as it's environmentally uh, sound and you know that we're not hurting the environment. So uh, number three, that 
we are in locations and we have guides that we're very familiar with that sort of work with us almost as if we were dancing together. You know, they, they, they know us, they know the light we're looking for, they know the position we're looking for. And so we all work hand in hand. And there's always that first safari that we go on in a new location where we develop those relationships and we learn about the location, we learn about the people, we learn about the guides. And we often do that on our own before we actually take safari groups to those places. But we are really all about connecting with nature and not being in the middle of a lot of dust and a lot of talking people and a lot of people that aren't interested in photography because we, you know, there's sometimes that I've spent an entire day, in fact, actually many times that I've spent an entire day sitting under a tree waiting for cheetahs to do something that's going to create a really awesome image and you just can't do that in a lot of locations. So those are the aspects that are really, really important to us. Yeah, as you mentioned, uh, you don't do the usual Kenya and Tanzania circuits. So you mentioned some of the advantages of these other locations. Uh, where where do you like to go? Well, my favorite, I've got a, actually several favorite places, but it's, you know, when, you, when you're picking a safari, there's really never a place that's 100% everything you want it to be. So in other words, we have a safari lodge in the Thule block of, uh, of Botswana in, on the Mashatu Game Reserve where, you know, it's, it's probably, in my opinion, one of the best places to naturally photograph big cats. However, the, you know, they don't have rhinos and buffalo there. And so then we have a place in South Africa that we go to in the northern part of South, South Africa. It's actually on the Botswana border where they, it is a big five area. And, but yet we, you know, leopards might be a little bit tricky to find. And so every location is unique and it offers very special things. And once, you know, once you've been on a safari and you sort of have the safari jitters out of you and and you're ready to to jump into a specialty type of safari where you may be concentrating on a specific species or a, spe a specific environment or something like that, then there's very specific places you'll pick for those types of safaris. But overall, you know, your first safari out, the location that we go to in South Africa, it's a big five area. You're going to get to see everything. It's not too crowded. We get to spend time with the animals and it's, it's really a good place. We also go to Zambia. Um, Zimbabwe is really good. And what I like about Zimbabwe is it's not at all crowded because a lot of people don't travel there because of the government situation. However, you know, we don't even encounter any of that. We don't see that. We just basically fly in, catch a bush plane to the lodge and you never are involved in any of that kind of stuff. And, and it's not crowded at all. We love Uganda. Um, Uganda and the gorillas are just a, a magical experience. My wife often says that there's two things in her life that she has done that have really created a life, huge, massive life-changing experience for her. One of them was swimming with the dolphins and the other one was, you know, being with those gorillas in Uganda. And we also really, really like Ethiopia. Um, also another place that's not very crowded and Ethiopia is stunning for the bleeding heart monkeys. There's several endemic species in Ethiopia, but Ethiopia has got some of the best tribal photography that I've ever encountered. It's, it's real, it's natural, it's not overdone. So you can photograph those people really doing what they really do. And Zambia is, is, is quite nice uh, along the rivers. And I, you know, I do like Namibia. Um, there's really only a couple of specific places in Namibia that are really good for wildlife, but it's also another good spot. So I know that was a long answer, but gosh, there's just so many answers to your question. Yeah. Well, you're definitely off the beaten path. No doubt, no doubt about that one. So uh, what uh, photo equipment do you recommend for somebody going on their first African safari? 
that would sort of depend on the nature of the photography, no pun intended, but, you know, are you going to be flying into that location and going to be driving into that location? And um, a lot of times when you fly in there, you know, there's, there's definitely going to be some weight restrictions. And if that's the case, then you'd probably want to have a lens that's multi versatile. You know, I, I'm a, a, a Sigma person. I use primarily Sigma lenses and, the new 60 to 600 gives me such a variety, such a range that quite frequently I can go on a safari and that's the only lens I need. However, I also will take a prime lens to some locations provided I'm not flying in. So you may fly, let's just say as an example, you'll fly from Atlanta to Johannesburg, South Africa. And, you know, Johannesburg is really a starting point for many of those locations in the southern part of Africa, Zimbabwe, Zambia, Botswana, Namibia, all of those places, really, you're probably going to have to fly into Johannesburg first. But we run a lot of safaris where we actually drive to the safari location from the Johannesburg airport. And in that case, as long as you can carry it on the plane or fit it in the overhead bin or however you're going to transport it from your location over to Africa, then it's a, you know, it's a breeze from there. So in those kind of trips, I will take a 60 to 600. I take a Sigma 500 Prime and I put a 1.4 converter on it. it, gives me a 700 millimeter lens. And the reason why is because there's just something special about that lens that gives me this like this bokeh and the sharpness that I haven't been able to obtain even with my Canon 600 millimeter lens. So it's just a very special lens to me. So, you know, everybody has that special lens that they really like, that special lens that gives them the quality that they're looking for. And as long as it's a drive to Safari from once you get over to Africa, then you can take multiple lenses if you'd like. But if it's a fly-in, then you want to go ahead and try to select a zoom lens that's going to cover as much territory as you can get out of it. So what are your thoughts about that uh, new 60 to 600? Uh, it's uh, not been around very long. Uh, I gather you like it quite a bit. I am I'm in love with that lens. You know, I have found that that 60 to 600 millimeter lens is just a, a magical lens for me. When I was heading over to Africa, when that lens was released, I hadn't had an opportunity to get it yet. So Sigma actually sent the lens to a friend of mine and he brought it over to Ethiopia for me to use. I found that the lens was exceptional because we were in the Ethiopian highlands. We were traveling basically up and down these huge mountains. So I needed the least amount of gear possible that could do the most bang for its buck, so to speak. And that 60 to 600 just gave me so many focal lengths that it was the only lens I needed. It was super sharp. It focused really quickly and it, and it just handled so, so well handle just like a like a sports car. Now, another really interesting thing about Ethiopia is you have the opportunity to do just incredible environmental portraits. And I had decided that that was the only lens I was going to use other than a 14 millimeter Sigma for a few really wide angle shots. And so I shot all these environmental portraits with that 60 to 600. And that's when I really learned that that lens is a masterpiece. I was pulling such sharpness out of that lens that it was, it, I don't know, it just has this extreme quality about it that, I don't know, it's just pure happiness. I don't know how else to describe it. The uh, older Sigma lenses had a reputation for being both heavy and slow to autofocus. I gather that they've overcome the autofocus at least. I think they have, and I actually think they've overcome a lot of things because I actually used to use Sigma lenses for a lot of my wedding photographers, and we did have a few of those issues, and we also had some reliability issues, but, you know, I've been using, um, well, my first one was the Sigma 150 to 600 Sport, and um, my goodness, these I've had these lenses now for several years, and they really, really get used. I mean, they get full of dust. We do Alaska a lot. They get rained on. They, 
they're just, they've just been phenomenal. And, you know, Sigma has really upped their ante. I mean, it's like their customer service, the quality of their glass, the lenses, everything seems to really be awesome right now. Well, that's good to hear. Uh, competition uh, never hurts anybody. So uh, keep uh, all the other manufacturers on their toes, I guess. Huh? <laughs> that's actually a really good point. And, you know, I'm a Canon, I use Canon cameras and I use still use a few Canon lenses but as I progress I'm switching everything you know my len lens wise I'm switching everything over to Sigma so it's not that I don't like Canon they, they make great stuff don't misunderstand me but I'm just really addicted to Sigma and you can't beat the prices that's a huge factor <laughs> so yeah so how about uh, other preparations uh, what clothes to take uh, medicines shots visas all that kind of stuff Sure. You know, again, depends on what country you go to. So some countries you have to have a an e-visa where you do it beforehand, like India is an example, you need to do it beforehand. And I think there's always a way to get your visa at the airport if you if you made a boo-boo and forgot to get it beforehand, but other countries don't require a visa. And so it's it's just vital that you go online and and check the specifics for the country you're going to. As far as passports, most countries require you to have like two or three empty pages in your passport where they can actually stamp it. Some countries require a six month uh, period before the passport expires after you return home. Some require a three month. So that's another thing you really need to check on. I always suggest you make a copy too, like just put your passport in your scanner or whatever and make a copy of that front page. Because if you lose your passport, and, th and this has actually happened to me, it happened to me once in South Africa, I went to the embassy and I had a, a paper copy and man, they replaced my passport. I mean, the American embassy was amazing. They even offered me money if I needed it. They were like, did you lose your wallet? Did you, you know? So they were really good and I had a new passport within a half hour, so. When it comes to medications, um, of course, we always suggest that you, you know, any really important medications that you carry those on your carry on and that you don't take those or put those in your uh, check in bags. And another thing you can do is just have an extra prescription from your doctor and keep that in your wallet. It's not a bad idea to have that with your eyeglasses as well. So that way, if you do lose your medication or you lose your eyeglasses and you forgot to pack a second pair, then you've certainly got a way to, you know, to take care of that. Because a safari is a big trip. It's an expensive trip. For some people, it's a once in a lifetime trip and you want to have everything right. When it comes to clothing, depends on the time of the year, really. Um, most of the safaris we do, we do in the change of seasons. So in other words, like uh, spring and fall in America, which would be the opposite in South Africa or, or obviously in all of Africa. But at any rate, um, during the change of the seasons, the animals are very active because they can actually feel something is going on. And, and also the weather is moderate and it just makes for a great time. You know, there are some fall colors you can pick up in Africa, it makes for a beautiful background. I personally don't really like shooting wildlife photography when everything is completely uh, barren of any foliage because I think it makes the images look a little bit, well, for lack of a better word, like dead. You know, it's just, I like to have a little greenery or something in my image to give it life. And I understand that philosophy that, you know, the less foliage that's on the trees, the, the less area there is for an animal to hide. So there's, there's ups and downs of, of everything, but me personally, I want some foliage in my images. As far as your gear is concerned, you know, obviously you want to pack as much of your gear as you can in your carry-on and make sure you put it into a camera bag that'll fit in the overhead bin. Most safaris don't really require a tripod because they are going to be in a safari vehicle and a tripod doesn't really work well in there. However, if you do put a tripod maybe in your check-in luggage, you might want to shoot some nights, you know, some starscapes or whatever, or some landscapes other than just being in the safari vehicle. When it comes to shoes, you do want to wear shoes that have some ankle support. Although most safaris aren't going to require a lot of walking, you will be climbing in and out of safari vehicles. And it's just nice to have a little extra support to, to keep your feet um, 
you know, your ankle from twisting when you're climbing in and out of the vehicle. The other thing is, I always say that everything in Africa is designed to survive, and that includes the foliage. I mean, it's like every bush has massive thorns on it, so you want to wear shoes that protect your feet. Yeah, that all uh, sounds like good advice. I assume you'd recommend people check out the uh, CDC website for specific recommendations for whatever country they're going to. Yes, absolutely. Um, you know, I think that, you know, they're definitely going to cover it. Um, in fact, they may even over cover it at times, but everybody wants to make sure that you, you know, are completely protected of, against anything that could potentially or possibly happen. And so a lot of the countries have various levels of malaria, like they could have a low risk or a medium risk or a high risk, and that's something you want to check on. A lot of places in South Africa, and remember there is a difference between Southern Africa and South Africa. So South Africa is an actual country, you know, Southern Africa just covers that Southern portion of the continent. So at any rate, um, South Africa, most areas are malaria free. So there are some malaria free areas throughout Africa as well as it depends on the time of year that you're traveling. But yes, great advice. Check it out. Make sure you're up to date on everything. And a flu shot's a good idea too because you're going to be on an airplane for, you know, 12 to 16 hours and uh, there's a lot of people on that plane that will probably be coughing and stuff. Yep, that all makes sense. Uh... So you have safaris going to a wide variety of places in Africa, plus South America and Alaska. How do you manage all that and uh, lead some semblance of a normal life? <laughs> well, that's a that's a that's a fun question, actually. You know, for me, being on safari is a normal life. Um, this year, I will spend probably eight to nine months of the year uh, out, out either on safari or we kind of call it on safari whether we're going to Alaska or Africa you know so so I am gone a lot but it is you know other than Trisha it is the love of my life and so well I forgot about my two corgis you know but I love them too but at any rate just kidding but it's because I enjoy it so much I don't have any problem being out there and doing it all the time it it's really my passion, and to be quite honest with you, I'd probably even do it more than I do now if I didn't have to come back to the to the states and make sure everything here was okay and catch up with all the clients that we have that go on safari with us and all that kind of stuff. Um, it's I, I can't I just can't even explain it to you. It's it's just so awesome. It's so magical to be out there, and I love photography. I love everything about photography, and I love everything about nature. And putting those two elements together is, it's not like a job for me. It's just something I love to do. And I also love teaching photography and sharing photography with people. It's funny because, you know, in the wedding industry, it's so competitive. I think at all, like commercial photography, it's so competitive. And and you don't want to share anything with anybody. You don't want to let anybody know what your secrets are, you know, because they might get a wedding from you or whatever. But when it comes to wildlife photography, um, the whole feeling of it, the whole sense of sharing nature and the ability to create a photograph to be able to show another human being where they will get a sense of just how beautiful the world is and also maybe a sense on how important it is to protect our environment and to keep these species healthy and do everything we can do to make our world the just the most beautiful place that it is. So do you manage all that with uh, just yourself and your wife, or do you have other staff members? Um, I have Patricia and I, and then I have just an incredible person who works for us here at the office. Her name is April, and uh, she's, a, she's a Christian. She's got a heart of gold. She's a hard worker. And more than that, she's got the morals. I mean, I learn morals from her. So she really watches out for us. We have another person here named Mary, and she's the same. She's just incredible. I mean, God has really been good to us to give us these two people. And so we also take them on safari with us. And they are actually in training to be able to go out and do safaris on their own. So, oh, well, sounds like a good thing for them, for sure. <laughs> they yeah they're but they deserve it they're wonderful people so 
Yeah. Those kind of people are hard to find, it seems like, these days. So uh, sounds like you are lucky. I am lucky. And, you know, we try to keep and maintain that sort of environment in our office. So we all learn from each other just how to be better people, how to treat people, how to be kind and loving. And it's it's sort of, it's funny because once you get started, it it just kind of flows, you know, and other people, it's a good way to be. So we yeah. love them. So uh, let's talk a minute about uh, Alaska. That's the other place that you spend some time and uh, talk about your trips up there and what brings you back to Alaska. Certainly. Alaska is, well, you know, as they say, the last frontier, but it it is so wild. And I think that it's one of the things that really attracts me to Alaska is that you really have to respect Alaska because not just the bears, you know, and the animals, but the the weather and everything there is extreme. And Alaska teaches you that nature is something to respect and something to look up to. So when I go there, I just get this overwhelming feeling. The bears are just I don't know, to watch them walk and to, to see that fur as it rolls down their back when they're walking and the, the expressions in their eyes and the the way they fish and the way they take care of their cubs. And I don't know, it's just, it's, it's magic. It just grabs me. And the, the environment itself, it's a wonderful place for landscapes. Now, it's a little tough there because it does rain a lot. And, you know, I come from New Mexico where it basically never rains. And so it's it's tough on the gear. It can be tough on your on your morale and your even on your emotions if you don't watch it because it's going to probably rain 50% of the time that you're there. But what we've learned is that the animals are also affected by the rain and their expressions, the what they do, the way they look, the water dripping off their fur. So when it's raining you don't want to put your camera away. In fact, you want to go get it and get out there because that's when you're going to get some of your best images. And it gives you so much time to think about your life and what you've done, what you're going to accomplish, where you're going to go. You know, you're in a boat. There's beautiful mountains around you. You're you're sitting on a beach watching bears fish and your mind just almost starts drifting into all these amazing things that you can do with your life. So it's a it's real captivating. So uh, where do you like to go on your trips up there? Uh, I gather maybe Lake Clark or Katmai? We, yep, we do both of those locations. Um, we do, actually, we do Lake Clark in September and we do Katmai in July. And I don't really have a preference. Um, you know, the one nice thing about September is the bears, the, their coats have grown back in. So they've got really thick fur and it just adds to the, the overall look of the bear, you know. Um, we also enjoy going up to Fairbanks and then flying up to Katovic to photograph the polar bears. That's a very, very fun thing to do. And also, you know, Denali, even though you can only drive in that first 15 miles unless you get a permit or you take the bus, you can get the bull moose and rut um, at, over that first 15 miles or so going into Denali in September, the, the moose are full in rut and they just are so much fun to photograph. And occasionally you get some caribou and stuff like that. But, you know, our primary focus is, of course, uh, the southern part where we go to, like you were saying, Katmai and Lake Clark. Okay. Well, before we go, uh, tell everyone where they can find you, your photography and your safaris. Uh, sure. Uh, my website is, uh, it's idubephotosafaris.com uh, and it's spelled I-D-U-B-E. Again, that's I-D-U-B-E photo, P-H-O-T-O, safaris, S-A-F-A-R-I-S.com, idubephotosafaris.com. Uh, Instagram, I'm also under idubephotosafaris. On Facebook, um, I'm under Kevin Dooley in Albuquerque, New Mexico. And, uh, you know, I post on there usually two to three times a day when I when I can. And uh, again, that's Kevin Dooley and it's in Albuquerque, New Mexico. And I welcome, I love 
looking at photos. I love sharing photos. I love talking about it. So please feel free to contact me. You know, uh, you can also send me a message on Messenger on Facebook. And uh, as far as the website goes, we do list all of our safaris on there. And, you know, most of our safaris do fill up and we do get a lot of repeat people, a lot of people that continually to go with us to different locations. And so always feel free to call me to see if, you know, we're adding something new or if you just want to chat about safaris. I love talking about this stuff. Yeah, I can tell. Well, thanks for being on Photographing the West, Kevin. The pleasure is all mine. And I cannot express my appreciation. You know, I'm not sure how you found me or located me, but um, I feel very honored and I think it was a gift and I've been blessed today to be able to talk with you and it was certainly a pleasure. The pleasure was all mine. Uh, I uh, love your photography and uh, glad we had a chance to talk. So for people listening, the show notes for this episode can be found uh, at www.flanaganphotos, spelled F-L-A-N-A-G-A-N-F-O-T-O-S, Dot com. Bye for now, and we'll talk soon. Thanks for listening to Photographing the West podcast. Please subscribe to the podcast in iTunes and leave us a review. Till next time, here's wishing you safe travels and good light.